Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, it does occur to me I didn't um, right I didn't I didn't say any administrative things um, at the start. Uh, I can, apparently I take a couple weeks off and forget how to give lectures. Um, project proposal I think is due before this lecture goes up. Uh, I'm not super sticky on that date, but hopefully now you know you're moving from the technology evaluation to the project phase of the course. Um, the the point of this project proposal is really for me to give some feedback on it um, to look and say you know too big too small um, maybe add this maybe don't do that um, so I'll try to get that feedback to you as soon as possible um, uh, what I'm not going to say I can't you know I, historically I don't think I've ever said to a group is that is a bad project don't do it um, so I you know you can start thinking about the project probably independent of my feedback. And then again, like maybe adjust the targets a little bit based on my feedback, but probably the, you know, don't, don't, you don't have to, to block on, you know, completely block on my feedback on it. Um, okay. <clears throat> so the, in this picture, uh, you know, high end picture that it is, um, what, wait, why does this not say br browser anymore? Um, this this app sometimes oh it's probably one time the app crashed it hadn't checkpointed that that edit anyway so we have this question here now i guess that i haven't addressed of like how is this broken up into like servers and processes so you know i did say there um you know the the reverse proxy and the front end server might be the same thing right they might be nginx and nginx might also just be serving static files um so it might be that like um yeah like all of this story is actually one process um <clears throat> you know it's just nginx running on a server or it might be you know maybe separate things like again you know two things running on the same hardware like on the same computer um but separate um you know, processes or whatever um you know how are we breaking up so probably the database is going to be one thing um you know maybe your application code is one server you know the mem memory cache maybe it's running on the same again same computer as the application server maybe not um so maybe maybe i'll extend my Oh, right maybe we're breaking the world up into servers that way um something like that anyway um okay so we have a three-tiered architecture and i feel like multi-tier architecture three-tiered architecture is it's a term that is like increasingly too simple for the way the world works but this is what people mean when they say it right so we have the user out here the user doesn't count and we have like front end, back end, and database that, you know, three layers in our, our application, three tier architecture. <clears throat> um, and again, I guess I'm drawing it on the slide as, a, as if each one of these is a computer or virtual machine or something. I, it, it doesn't really matter how they're deployed as long as they're running somehow and can, can communicate. Um, so I guess you know, no matter how clever I am, and I'm not, again, I'm not sure my diagram is, is has gone well this, this offering, but um, how fast can things go, right? So it's a question of how many users do we have out here? How many requests are they making per second or per day or whatever? Um, <clears throat> can we keep up? You know, can we keep up and have reasonable response times? And things like you know, having the, the static files served by a nice fast front end server, not by some slow application code and having reasonable things cached and having like using your ORM well, so you make decent database queries, all of those things help and they will make things go faster and that's great. But okay, well, what happens when things, you know, do slow down? There's a limit on just how fast a computer can go. Um, <clears throat> And the answer is replicate. So the way the world has been arranged here, um, 
the and well i guess again ignoring the cache server here there's no there's no mod modified state here right there's nothing that changes on the front end server right i deploy my code assuming i'm not changing these static files everything here is exactly the same from one request to the next everything here is exactly the same from one request to the next the database changes right i'm going to insert and update things in my database but everything else is completely stateless there's nothing that has to change there's no files that are re you know created and destroyed um presumably on on these other servers so i can have more than one copy of them all right so instead of one server doing ruby on rails work i have four i guess in my picture and instead of one nginx server i have two in this picture so now the question is well which one right so when the user comes in which which one should they contact and a load balancer can can take care of that um so this is a fairly easy job and it's it's probably just like you know a round robin like one request goes here one request goes here and just alternate back and forth and both of these front end servers do exactly the same job and send exactly the same responses all four of these back end servers do exactly the same job and send exactly the same responses so i can have as many copies as i need to kind of keep up with the load um <clears throat> so hard to replicate the load balancer in my story because now the load balancer is the thing that is effectively like known to the world as you know www.example.com and hard to replicate the database just because most relational databases aren't good at at being distributed and um having many replicas okay that's not really true it's a little bit true <clears throat> So this works because these servers aren't storing anything. Again, there's no, if, if I'm in a situation where the backend server writes a file to the disk and then, you know, 10 requests later, somebody requests that page and we have to read that file. Well, we have to make sure that all of these servers have the same files because they're presumably supposed to give exactly the same response. So maybe we need a database, maybe we need some separate file storage thing um, something like Amazon S3 or similar, uh, like something that can store files in a way that all of our backend servers can ask and say, hey, you know, I need a copy of this file, please. Or please store, please delete this file. Um, so maybe, maybe my sentence there is a lie. State is stored only where we think about storing it. Again, in my picture here, it's a database. Again, it's, I have some separate file storage server that, that is shared. Anything I'm reading and writing that has to update, I have to think now really carefully about because that part I can't replicate. I have to have a sort of canonical place to store that data. Um, the other thing I get here is redundancy, right? If you have to update, reboot, whatever, one of these servers, okay, well, the load balancer, you know, you, maybe your site goes a little bit slower because you have one instead of two front end servers or three instead of four back end servers, but your state, your, your site is still alive. Um, <clears throat> so for replication here, and again, I think, I think there becomes, there comes some limit here of, you know, okay, maybe we have a load balancer in the picture there. That's not better. Um, I'm just going to not, um, maybe, but maybe we put a load balancer in the picture here and then the other things, um, can be replicated. I guess you can replicate the cache too. So both memcached and Redis can cluster uh for free like they're they're good at at maintaining a shared cache and i guess the other thing is if i do have a non-shared cache well that's okay it's not as good if i do have like four separate caches on each backend server that's probably not the right choice but i'm still caching somewhat it's still probably better than nothing um so um come back to the load balancer like at least in the picture that i've drawn so far the load balancer kind of has to be unique it has to be the thing that the world knows as www.example.com um come back to that um scaling on the database server is a little bit harder because of course relational database servers um expect that you expect asset guarantees so i guess consistency is the one that is a little bit hard to do if you're going to have a bunch of servers sharing a load and and have some kind of distributed database deal. 
Um, so for, I guess, this, this depends on the database server and in some cases how much money you're willing to spend uh, for non-free uh, updates on the database server. But uh, both MySQL and Postgres can have read-only replicas. So you can have the database server that receives all the writes, like all updates and inserts have to go here. And then I have read-only copies of the data. And so again, if you have a high read-to-write ratio, that's great. So I can just, I can have 10 copies of my data on 10 database servers. One, one is the one that receives all the writes. It distributes them to everybody else. And then I have nine servers that I can do a select query on. Um, that again, that can be really good. And again, think about the case like Wikipedia here. But so it's relatively infrequent to have to update a page. It's very frequent to have to read that page uh, from your database and, and do the work. And again, Wikipedia, I don't know if they still publish actually. They used to publish these um, server architecture diagrams of like how many servers and what's going on. Um, they had a whole bunch of read-only replicas of their database and a whole bunch of caching proxies for squid uh, sitting in front, uh, uh, caching proxies using squid sitting in front of everything. Um, I haven't seen that for a while and I don't have it linked in my slides. Maybe I'll look for it. Maybe I'll, you know what? I'm gonna pause and look for it. Okay, um, just just to uh, um, like I, I I don't know that I think I think their world has also gotten a little more complex and it's hard to to put in a diagram. Um, but you know, if we, even if we go back to like their 2006 world here, um, they had these uh, caching proxies um, or like reverse proxies, these conical things in in different par parts of the world, right? So these are. They're just, you know, HTTP caches um, in, again, the Netherlands and wherever their main servers are, whatever. And then, uh, <laughs> right, database replicas. And uh, I don't know why they're out. Oh, the, the web servers that are actually doing the work, 105 of them, apparently, according to, again, at this point in time. And I'm sure their architecture has gotten both more complex and more simple in various ways. Um, but yeah, so yeah, they've stopped updating these diagrams, which is probably for the best because they are, uh, I think, yeah, there's too much to easily draw that way. Um, <clears throat> so, right. So um, doing that horizontal scaling on a relational database is not impossible, but can be tricky. Um, um, da modern databases are getting better at this. Um, if you really, really have to go to a NoSQL database, um, and again, like I said, when I was talking about databases, like 100%, absolutely no question. If I was creating a site, I don't care what kind of site, relational database is going to be my first choice. Um, I think the NoSQL databases are very much something you should think of as an optimization to do if you need to. Um, you give up so much. Um, like the the way the way you store data in a non-relational database depends on the queries you're going to make. You have to know how you're querying data in order to use a non-relational database effectively. If you don't, and if you don't structure your data knowing the queries you're going to make, you're just using a database that's worse for no reason, um, frankly. So again, I'm definitely going to start here. If I ab If absolutely no question, I absolutely have to abandon the concept of relational databases. I guess I would, but for a website, it's going to be a very, very difficult sell for me. Um, so again, I think this is where the NoSQL databases come up because they're designed to scale. Um, if you use something like Cassandra, it's just part of the architecture that you're going to have more than one server. You're going to have one, two, 10, 100, 1,000 database servers that are all in some way replicating and sharing the data so that queries can go really fast and there's good redundancy and everything else. But you're going to you're going to give something up to get there. Um, just it's an interesting note. Uh, it's a 2015 article for Pinterest. Um, so again, unless you're bigger than Pinterest was in 2015. Um, so they they kept everything in MySQL. And this story is basically we understood it. Um, <clears throat> we could have gone to Cassandra or or HBase or something like that, but 
we understood MySQL. And they're very much in the story, to be fair, not using MySQL as a relational database. They're using it in some ways a lot more like a, um, a, like a key value store almost. Um, so they're, they're storing like some records on different database servers. And then they have this lookup table that says like, this collection of keys is here. This collection of keys is here. So they have to then distribute that knowledge of which records are in which database server. So this is very, this is not the relational database server of compute 354, but, um, they've scaled very, very much, um, on, on old fashioned database technology in some sense. Anyway, I'm going to get off my database high horse. Uh, relational databases are awesome. Um, so the picture that I'm drawing here without success keeps getting more complex. And the thing that I think probably surprises me the most in web development between like when I first, you know, wrote a line of PHP code or whatever, and now is how many moving parts there end up being in this picture. Um, you end up realizing like, oh, you know what I also need here is like, um, how do I, um, I also need to do like full text search, right? I need, I need just a, a search within my site, Wikipedia or whatever. So I end up with a separate thing for that. Um, so that ends up being something like Elasticsearch or Solar. Um, um, or, oh, whoops. Yeah, <laughs> you end up, um, pardon me, that was not visually exciting. Um, you end up with a, a search server, basically, this separate thing that is just for your your search box or you end up with something like log stash that is okay i have all of these now distributed servers i have many copies of my my application server what if one of them throws an exception how do i know and well that okay now i have a com another completely separate thing for logging and the keyboard came up which means my drawing app crashed um but I have another thing for logging and I have another thing like I have celery or um, active tasks, I think it's the one in Rails uh, for just some asynchronous task. Like I just, I need this to happen or I need this to happen at, at seven in the morning every day or whatever. And all of these pieces end up in this architecture diagram that that is not there anymore. Um, so, okay, you have complexity in just your architecture, how many things have to be running? Where are they? Um, how how are you going to distribute that on servers, right? Like there's still, there has to be computers here one way or the other, right? I can draw all the pictures in some sketchy drawing app that I want. Um, I, I, there has to be a computer that's gonna run all this stuff. Um, or virtual machines that run all this stuff or Docker containers that run all this stuff how do we how do we just deal with the complexity between all of these pieces um so even something like this again this page um how do we like if if, if i decide like i i have an edit link here you don't right if i decide to edit this page um well we have to somehow invalidate the cache and maybe we have to invalidate the cache or a bunch of stuff because of some uh application specific rules like something like this page like these are the the due dates come from some other database table like there's a due date for exercise one and it's read and inserted there so that means if i update the due date for assign for exercise one every page has to has to be invalidated in the cache that's uh, that's gross um um i need to update the full text search um because again some page got updated or whatever i don't need that to happen within the next millisecond in fact it's not but i, I need it to happen pretty soon um so maybe i have this distinction now between synchronous and asynchronous work that's going to happen um and again, I have all of these things that I need to communicate between, maybe I need a message broker for that. Um, 
so um uh, again I, i'm repeating myself but i'm repeating myself in a different course if you're taking 383 from me i i would have talked about these things there um when i was describing basically um microservices um even though i don't remember if i called them microservices or not um but the idea of these um message queues or message brokers is really just well again effectively it's just a message queue it's just somebody sends a message somebody receives a message but this tool makes sure it actually gets delivered so the idea here is that you can do something like you say well okay i have work that has to be done again this is the i need somebody to re-index re this page in my Elasticsearch server sometime soon so you put the the task into a work queue and you say okay here's all the re-indexing work that has to be done and you have some re-indexing processes that are willing to do it and they receive messages as they as they arrive or as they need to be received um so that's the idea of all of these queuing services um or at least in this context so okay that's another way for me to communicate between all of these processes that i have running um in my picture here um ah oh, the, the app crash deleted the last few things that i had in my diagram that uh, now i'm sad um hold on here let me let me fix my draw okay um so again as our as the picture gets more complex here um okay now because we have all of these moving pieces and we need to communicate between them we have a separate thing whose job it is to just send messages um so uh yeah rabbit mq or zero mq um and it is really surprising to me again the more i do this how quickly things get added to this diagram and how complex it ends up being well okay uh, maybe don't want to run another service, but this one is doing something pretty useful for me. Again, I can every time I have a, a I, I want to log some user action, I just throw it into a Rabbit MQ. Uh, which one is that going to be? Is it publish subscribe maybe for logging? Where you know I'm, I'm going to log. Maybe I have redundant logging servers in case one goes down or whatever. So a log message goes in, and both log servers receive it, and Rabbit MQ is going to take care of that and make sure that. You know everybody who sends and receives is, is doing the right thing um these things are fast like rabbit mq uh, zero mq uh, sqs uh, kafka all of these things are are really really fast and really really robust and that's great and i think they're a good trade-off for this kind of thing when you need them um maybe you want something a little bit higher level um so uh salary or hmm, i should have changed that link uh is it active um active task active job um yeah so it's active job in rails uh salary whether or not their website works i don't know but um their doc site usually there we go um is basically like i want to have a function and i want to be able to call the function in a way that it will run asynchronously it will run sometime soon um so it's effectively that one of these message queues with a little bit higher level um semantics on top um i just need i need this work to happen please so again something like i can you please update the full text search for this page because somebody's done an edit it'll happen soon or can you please send this email or can you please do whatever other thing that again doesn't have you know we don't have to make the user wait for it but we need it done pretty soon um so again like you probably don't need these things for your project but you probably need to i i think it's worth knowing that they exist maybe i'll say it that way um like i you know i will be surprised if i see projects in this course that involve deploying rabbit mq or like using rabbit mq as the message passing backbone for for salary or something like that because it's it it is a relatively um you know it's not something you have to do on every line of code but geez it just seems to build up 
in life um, as a as a project gets more complex and you have more functionality that has more like weird corner cases of like okay now this part has to interact with that part um, and something like RabbitMQ is a very nice way to do that. Um, so this complexity now is a thing, right? Like I have all of these things that sort of appear in my picture and how do I, how do I make sure this is running and this is running and how do I make sure that this code knows how to talk to this thing? And, uh, it sounds like a lot of work. Um, and I guess, right, if I have replication, you know, I have, um, I have 10 copies of my application server running my framework code. Well, what do I do when I update my code? Um, I've got new code because I've got new code, did some development. Um, I have to deploy it. Um, how do I make sure they're all running the most recent version of my code? Um, so this is where um, I guess this started on exercise four and uh, then continues in exercise seven and nine, if I'm remembering right. Um, this configuration management, like how do I express in code uh, a deployment, basically? I, you know, how do I express that, okay, this has to be running and this code has to be here and all of that stuff. And I think infrastructure as code is maybe not the only description of this thought, but I kind of like it just as a, you know, it's, it's the thing that sits in my head uh, that is, right, I need a server deployment. I need a configuration file. I need whatever else. I want to turn that into code so it's in my version control system. And it's versioned and everything else. So this is what's been happening in these exercises. Um, I have no idea how this, uh, I think exercise seven is in the past as I as you watch this lecture, I don't even remember. Um, but this is what's happening with either Chef or Docker. Um, Chef is a tool for configuring a virtual machine or a, a computer, I guess, a virtual machine being an example of a computer. Um, Docker being a tool for configuring a container. Um, I don't know what a container is. I, I, a container is sort of like a virtual machine conceptually, but more like a process in terms of how long it takes to like start and, and destroy. Um, it, it uses the, uh, the kernel from the outside operating system. So it's not like, it's not a completely separate running machine, but it has its own like file system and libraries and everything else. Um, but again, virtual machine or container at this moment, I guess I don't care. Same, same. Um, what I want to make sure is that I understand the configuration of everything. Again, I have if I have several copies of my application code, I want to make sure they're the same all the way across. Um, I want to know um, what this configuration file is, what configuration file has to be where, and if that configuration file changed yesterday, I want to know how. Um, so I need that to be in my virtual control system and then injected into the virtual machine or the container um, at the right moment and consistently. Um, and right, so all of this is going to be dynamic, right? So I'm changing my code, I'm changing a configuration file. Um, I need to change all the copies. I need to know how, I need to make sure we're running version 1.0.1 because there was some security update or whatever else. Um, the other question that, uh, you know, I. Ugh. that I've tried to answer over here in this now static diagram because I'm tired of uncrashing this app um, that I kind of did with the like red dotted line here as well. What what What's running on a computer or in a process or in a container? Um, you know, do I have separate computers for all of these things or virtual machines for all of these things? Um, I don't know. And it might change. And again, it's going to change as my, my site shrinks and grows. Like if I, if I have more and more users, I'm going to need more and more hardware to run the site. Um, so th things might move. And again, the, the IP address of my RabbitMQ server might change because I had to give it its own virtual machine or whatever. So some of this is what 
uh, containerized containerization of things and Docker is trying to sort of address. Um, I'm not going to draw these these red circles. I just have thing. So a, a, a one thing, one my application server or my memcached or my RabbitMQ or my nginx. Each one of those is one thing running in one container. I don't have three different things running in a container. I just have you know, a, a unicorn process running Ruby on Rails code in one container. And maybe I have several copies of that container, but there's no question of like, which three things do I put in a single container? I have three separate containers for them. Um, the architecture that's enforced by this, the way containers work is you basically have a network. Um, so again, like if each, each thing in this diagram so like I have an Nginx container and a, a WSGI Django container and a memcached and I'm a, the only way I can communicate between them, the only thing, the only way to draw this arrow is I have some network communication because that's the only thing that's shared between them. Um, that means I can't sort of, or like I basically am prohibited from having any other shared state, right? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna communicate by writing a file and expecting somebody else to read the file because I just don't have that option. So in some ways, this, uh, this thing, it starts to feel like a microservice architecture um, where, again, I have many, many small operations happening in separate containers. It's not, it's not a technical solution. It's a, it's a uh, architectural solution. It's, it's a way to ensure that my code is good and that I understand all the interactions between all of the pieces of my system because they're just network communication and whatever network ports I open on a container, that's one of the ways I'm allowed to communicate with that. Or it's the only way I'm allowed to communicate with that container. So that's great. It's good architecture. Um, you could have done it. You know, if you have one virtual machine and you're going to put everything on that one virtual machine, as you are, if you're using chef um, and uh, a virtual machine for the project, um, you can still do this. You can still have the parts of your system only have communication over the network between each other. You just have to enforce that in your in your code. You have to do it right. Um, if I do have these things, and again, in this picture, um, I'm going to have, again, Nginx, application, cache, search, um, message passing, and database. I think I just counted six containers. And I'm probably going to have multiple copies, right? I'm probably going to have several copies of my application server so I can do like a rolling restart. Like if one has to be restarted because I have new code, or sorry, if the application has to be restarted because I have new code, I can have the I can bring one container down, bring the new copy up, bring the next one down, bring the new one up, and my site's alive all the way through that process. Um, so these container orchestration tools are really about that. And Effectively, we're using Docker Compose, um, at least like the the um, guidelines for the project are really like use Docker Compose as a super, super minimalist uh, container orchestration where it's just like, here are the containers I need to run them. Um, these other tools are really, okay, well, I'm not just going to run containers on a computer. I'm going to run many containers and many cop redundant copies of them, and I'm going to run them across a bunch of virtual machines or physical computers and we will you know somehow balance out of like well if i need if i want 10 application containers i'll have five of them here and five of them here and then so if that computer has to restart well five of my application servers are still alive or um again i can do a rolling restart on them to make sure um all my code gets updated somewhere over the next few seconds so that's what these tools are fundamentally about. And I don't, I was just about to say, I don't care. I do care about that. Uh, but for this course, um, I just want the containers to come up <laughs> and live. And Docker Compose is enough for that. There's a long way to go for that, but that's why I've sort of suggested Docker Compose. It's not it's not the, the container orchestration tool for production, but it's good enough to get your project running and see it go and have all the pieces in containers and no, and I guess to know that you could move to one of these other tools with configuration updates, not code updates. Um, 
the the thing that bugs me sometimes about like containerized like like kubernetes tutorials or whatever is the same thing that bugs me about front end tutorials uh, again i complained earlier that the you know you do the the react tutorial and it's like oh yeah you just query your api they don't address who wrote that api because it's you like if you want to query the api you have to create the api and all of those tutorials just kind of gloss over it they just oh this magic api appears um, I find it's the same for things like Kubernetes um, or a Docker Swarm, or no matter whatever. Um, there's still a computer there. Like you still need to have a computer, and you could be, you know, you could be getting a virtual machine from some cloud provider, uh, Amazon EC2 or whatever. You could be doing some uh, container service from, again, from Azure or uh, Amazon or whatever, but there's still a computer and you still need to have that configuration there and again i feel like the tutorials for containers or any container docker kind of tool is just like oh you just have the computer do it you just have the container run on the computer and they don't address what computer where did this computer come from how did it get configured with docker how did i have how do i now have five of these things all configured with docker and communicating and that's um Again, it's it's not it's not the end of the world, but the tutorials uh, sometimes feel misleading because it's just like, oh yeah, you just make it go. Well, there's still a computer somewhere. Um, so, all right, I guess the th this is something I have been talking about and not really uh, addressing, as always in this course. All of these things are circularly dependent, and I have to I have to speak uh, in a linear fashion no matter what. So um computers what's up with that um i guess is the theme here so you know the old-fashioned way to do this um buy a computer plug it in plug it into a network install things on it and then start writing your code well you don't want to do that um if you're somebody who wants to have a website what you don't want to have is a computer that you have to plug in and host and a network to maintain and everything else um partially because you might want to scale that up right if you all of a sudden have a lot of users you don't want to have to wait two weeks for the new computer to arrive so you can service those users and get the request dealt with um so let somebody else do it let's not forget it's all just computers um there's this question here of whether amazon is buying the computer or you're buying the computer or microsoft or google or whoever else and okay, probably in the modern world, you don't want to be the one buying the computer. You're going to have somebody else do it. But let's not forget, it is just a computer. Uh, it's, you know, a physical thing with a power cord and a network jack and whatever else. But you don't, you don't have to worry about those details. Um, I'm not sure this, this, um, uh, this categorization of cloud services makes sense in the modern world either, but I'm going to go with it because it's what people talk about. Um, so three things that can be sort of cloud services, software as a service, which is probably not something we're using. I mean, you know, we're, I guess we're probably using GitHub or whatever occasionally in our lives. Um, maybe you're creating software as a service, but I think from the developer's perspective, we move on. Um, and then again, this increasingly weird feeling distinction of platform as a service versus infrastructure as a service. Um, platform as a service usually describes things like uh, Amazon Lambda, which is basically um, you have a function, they can run the function. It's fundamentally what these tools are, are offering you. So I uh, hear some code. Here's some code that when a re some, some uh, um, input like this happens, an HTTP request or whatever, um, dear Amazon, please run this code. And they charge you by the processor millisecond or whatever to run the code and generate the response um so that's good in that you don't even have to worry about computers anymore you just have code runs and code runs as often as it needs to uh, you know wherever it makes sense to run it and you don't have to worry about computers or anything that's great um what if it's not running fast enough? What if the startup time is is unacceptable? What if, 
your budget is really high because you're using a lot of memory for reasons that you don't quite understand. Um, what if what if Amazon raises their prices and you want to move all of your cloud hosting to to uh, Google or Azure instead? Um, I would be very nervous with those kinds of restrictions. Um, which one of these was it? Um, yeah, I mean, so again, one way or another here, fundamentally, this is I have code, I want to run it in response to a request coming in. And that's fundamentally what all of our front end servers are doing. We're, we're sort of outsourcing that to the cloud provider. Um, I would be very suspicious about the lock-in for, for any of these tools, but hey, uh, I'm not rich because of my, my web development. So who am I to say? Um, the, the sort of more low level side of this is, um, basically the infrastructure as a service is you get you get computers. You get a virtual machine, um, which is what the um, VirtualBox and Chef version of the project deployment is sort of imitating. Um, Amazon gives you a virtual machine. Well, they don't give it to you. Amazon rents you a virtual machine. Um, and then you do something to configure that the way you want. Um, maybe it's be, by having a disk image. Maybe it's by having something like Chef do the configuration, whatever it is. And Again, you get more popular, you have more of them. Overnight, you destroy some of them because you don't need that and you can save on costs. Um, sorry, I guess I should say that uh, certainly the the Chef VirtualBox version of, uh, of the project setup. Um, so something, again, I, I don't feel like those, um, that categorization of uh, platform and infrastructure as a service really captures is like, well, what about containers? Um, so the like Amazon Elastic Container Service is, okay, I have all these Docker containers. I need to run them, please. And I am going to pay you by, uh, I'm going to pay you somehow in some way that's, that's surprisingly subtle and surprisingly I find difficult I, I think I would find difficult to predict um, how, how much I'm about to spend on um, on Elastic Container Service, but yeah, how many how many virtual CPU hours am I using? I don't know. Um, anyway, um, also an option though. Again, if you have things um, that are going to be done in containers, eh, maybe that's a good way to deploy. Um, maybe you should think kind of carefully about your costs if you're about to do that. Um, one thing, uh, so I guess I already mentioned lock-in. Um, you know, what if, what if Amazon is like, ah, forget all this uh, AWS business, we're going to go back to selling books and only books. Um, or again, the, the much more realistic uh, danger is, okay, the, you know, Amazon realizes they've got a lot of uh, applications locked into Amazon uh, land and they're using any one of these hundreds of technologies and like, okay, somebody depends on Amazon light sale or whatever. It's hard to, it's hard to leave. So they could, they maybe start edging the prices up to see what happens. Um, you don't want to be in a situation where that is like a huge problem realistically. Um, the other thing that I find people don't think about when they're in their twenties and uh, you know thinking about um, course projects and startup companies and stuff is well, what about regulatory compliance? Um, like, you know, Canvas, Courses, um, GoSFU, running them on AWS is not a, an option legally. Uh, you know, we're we're obliged to keep your private data private and not share it with Jeff Bezos. Um, so, okay, those things are on premises. They have to be legally. And the same is true for like banks and stuff. Like they have very specific laws that I think, again, I feel like people in their twenties don't worry about. And sometimes you have to. Um, so yeah, like, realistically, if I was going to make a thing and I didn't have a regulatory comp compliance problem, 
uh, you know, 100%, no question. I am going to, you know, maybe be choosing between Azure and, and Amazon and have a look at their prices and, and what they offer. But obviously, obviously, I think in the modern world, you're going to cloud host any web app, uh, any web logic is going to go there. Um, I think just while I'm on the subject of what I would do, um, sorry, back here in the, um, you know, Docker versus um, virtual machines, like I think, you know, absolutely, I would, I would target Docker containers. And I don't know which one of these three things I would want to orchestrate it, or if I would want to do it with um, Elastic Container Service or whatever, but I think it would be, well, how am I going to get these containers to run it would be the, the question I would be asking next. Um, one cloud thing that I haven't talked about, and I do feel like I need to say a little bit about here, is, well, just the, the worldwide nature of the World Wide Web, I guess. Um, this is the problem, that if, if my server is here and halfway around the world I have a user, hey, I hope I do, right? I want a lot of users, I want them all over the place. If they are going to send a request and get a response, that's going to take a minimum of 134 milliseconds. So that's just the speed of light time to do that halfway around the planet and back the other half. Um, that's noticeable, right? Just, I mean, that's pretty good. Like if there's no other delay, if there's no network delay and there's no delay, like the it's instantaneous to generate the response, that's pretty good, but that's not realistic like i have real time questions about how big the planet is and how long it takes to get data from one side to the other um especially if what i'm talking about is say my database right if every single database query has to make that that path um that's going to be questionable every single request for like a static file or whatever else that's a lot um so leaving dynamic content aside um, let's just worry about static content, right? And I, as I talked about a few weeks ago, most of the bytes are static, right? So if I look at any given website, web page, whatever, um, this one, and I bring up the thing and I reload the page, um, okay, so one one piece here is dynamic. Everything else I suspect here is a static file on disk. So maybe I maybe I'll just start by worrying about static content. So a content delivery network, at least traditionally, they're they're branching out a little bit from this, but traditionally it's really just a way to serve static files really fast globally. So uh, CloudFront, Google Cloud, Akami, these are the ones you may have heard of. Um, and then again, I, I mentioned like CDNJS uh, for like just JavaScript files that are like kind of a special purpose for just those. Um, but these are ones you can use for your static files. <clears throat> so the, I, the, the hope here is that, where's their map? There we go. Like any one of these dots is somewhere that my, um, you know, my, output whatever.js like that file instead of coming from the one server that has the the database and the the application logic and whatever else running the static content can come from any one of these dots because it can be cached at any one of those dots or any one of these places that is the amazon point of presence um <clears throat> Okay, so that'd be nice, right? Um, and okay, I tried this before class. Let's see here. Um, okay, so docs.microsoft.com is where this image came from. Again, I, I, I checked it ahead of time. Um, okay, where is it? Um, <clears throat> okay, so it took, okay, so it takes like three milliseconds or so for me to get out of TELUS. Um, and it get, it takes somewhere between four and eight milliseconds for me to get to, um, okay, stop, you're not, okay, something called, something that contains YVR in the host name. So I'm going to, I'm going to highly suspect that this, that image, and in fact, probably this whole site came from 
somewhere in Vancouver. So, you know, from that server um, on the Microsoft content delivery or for Amazon, um, let's see here again, I want that image, please. What if I say please? Okay, that image. Um, no, no, not the link, the image. <sighs> Stupid everything. Um, is it a background image or something? Um, a smarter man would have written down the host name before class, but here we are. Um, I know I saw it. Um, and it's not aws.amazon.com, of course. It's, um, it's something like amazonstatic.com. Um, oh, there it is. Okay, yeah. So a0.awsstatic.com is where that image came from. Um, where is it? Um, it is, well, again, it's a, a single digit number of milliseconds away, probably in Seattle on CloudFront. Um, so for whatever reason, like, even though they say they have a Vancouver location, like again, I'm just I'm just guessing from this host name saying C for Seattle. Um, for whatever reason, I think I'm getting that image from Seattle, not from the Vancouver location, but it's really fast. And the game that I played in this example over here, that to be fair, I haven't updated for a while, but um, <clears throat> so I tried this like. In my office, like I had this image from um, i.ytimage.com, the, the YouTube content delivery network. Um, so that image came from something nearby um, from this IP address. But I started up a virtual machine in California and I looked up that that host name and I got a different IP address and in Singapore I got a different IP address and in Frankfurt I got a different IP address and each, in each case it was close by so when I went to get it from you know if I if I go from my computer here right now um, I get again something that is like five milliseconds away Again, I'm just going to guess in Seattle, again, from the, the host name that's coming by there, um, and the fact that I seem to have transited to Seattle. Um, but hey, five millisecond latency to that server is pretty fast. If I had to get it from this one that is in probably Europe, that was going to be a lot slower. And again, the thing that I did here, it's you know, 20 milliseconds, it's 160 milliseconds, if I get kind of the wrong one on the wrong side of the planet, because networks aren't that fast. Um, so that's really nice, right? So as long as my DNS lookup can be just a little bit more clever uh, than a dictionary lookup, uh, I'll get a, my content from a nearby server. As long as the like various caching things are working, no problem, right? Static content comes from wherever. As long as I've set my expires header and everything else, they take care of it. And like turning on CloudFront or Cloudflare for a website is really, really very easy if it's static content. Um, and that's great. For dynamic content, again, the story gets, a, well, much more complex. So I think the thing that I've probably been describing as the, you know, as I've been doing this lecture has been, okay, I have one canonical database server and one you know, nearby cluster of application servers that are going to make queries to that database, um, and then maybe proxy after that. And that's what that Wikipedia diagram from 10 years ago was showing, that all pages got generated in Florida and then cached globally. Um, or if I want to generate pages in various places around the world, um, um, like I can start up um, AWS instances in these places. So a smaller collection of, of locations because it's more complicated to set up an entire data center, not just a caching um, uh, point of presence. But okay, so I could start 
you know, servers in a couple different places around the world. Um, but then, okay, if I'm going to run my code in various places around the world, uh, I'm going to query a database. I don't want every database query to take 150 milliseconds, so my database has to be distributed. This is another reason for something like uh, Cassandra or HBase, um, a NoSQL database that is good at this, um, CouchDB, uh, those kinds of things. They're good at being distributed around the world, and they're good at dealing with those consistency problems that, that arise when you have distributed database servers. Then I can run my logic globally. Um, Again, I think this, you know, this is definitely a version two kind of problem in my mind that getting the static content distributed globally, super easy configuration change, you know, um, sign up for the one of these that seems the most reasonable to you and point all your static content to that server and off you go. Um, globally, um, you know, having a globally distributed application, much trickier. Um, again, lots of coherence problems, uh, data coherence problems to worry about, um, but it can be done. And again, I think for this course, um, it can be done is probably the important takeaway. Um, you're probably not going to do it. Um, okay, so that ends that slide deck, and I think that's a good spot to stop. So I don't know, I'm going to. Um, I don't know, keep doing whatever's due, keep doing that stuff, and I will. Come back next week and uh, talk about URLs and rest. See you then, everybody.